All right, hi there. Welcome to the summary worksheet for Chapter 2 from Scott Stevens's Think and Do book. And it's worth pointing out early that these answers are actually available in the back of your book, whether you got the text or the um, print version or the PDF version. These solutions are in the back of the book. But I'll run through them um, fairly quickly here verbally um, because you do have access to these in the back of the book, but you might want to hear a little bit more explanation than is immediately available in print. So, let me get started here by putting us into full screen mode. There we go. So the way we start here is that we, um, you know what I'm going to do though, this might be good. Maybe if I change the color of my pen, because the answers are in red, so I'll use a blue pen. Great. Brilliant. <laughs> All right, so what there is going on here, five numbers, right? And I ask you for a bunch of stuff, a bunch of uh, descriptive statistics, mean, median, mode, range, sample variance, sample standard deviation. All right, so first the mean, and all we do here for the mean is we add up all the x values and we divide by the number in our sample. So you add up all the numbers, divide by five, 76.6. For the median, you first have to order them, right? And then you have to split that in half. Fortunately, since it's an odd number, we do have one right in the middle, 70. So we've got a median. Um, the mode, fortunately, there are two 68s. So the mode does exist. Uh, the winner is 68. Uh, the range is the biggest value 93 minus the smallest value 68 which is 25 the variance and the standard deviation we're going to build with this chart so take a look here's our numbers we're going to put them in a chart um, in a column so here they are 68 68 70 84 93 and then the next column we're going to take each x value and subtract the mean now the mean was calculated up here as 76.6 so I take each one of these values and subtract 76.6. So we get these differences here, and then we have to square them, which makes all those values positive. Remember, they always have to be positive. And, um, and we add all those things up. So this gives us the, um, the hardest part of our formula, right? The formula for the standard deviation looks like that. All right. And so what we just did was we just did this part. We took all the values, subtracted the mean, squared them, and added them all up. That's what this is right here. So when we stick that into our formula, we get 515.20 here. And then we divide by the sample size, and there's 5 here, right? So we have 5 minus 1. So there's the formula. And when you take 515.2 divided by 4, you get the 128.8. And then you take the square root of that, you get 11.3490. We round that to 11.3 because we're going to one more decimal place. The raw data was one whole number, or a whole number, no decimal places. So one extra decimal place is one decimal place. By the way, that's what we did with the mean, too. The mean was the one decimal place as well. And so the standard deviation is 11.3. And notice we actually got the variance in there on our way. Because this whole thing, everything inside the radical, everything in there, that's the variance. Right. And so when we simplified that, we got 128 over 8. So that's how we got a variance. 128.08, take the square root, and get the standard deviation with 11.3. And so, in part G, I say, all right, what if I take my 68, one of these 68s from the original set of data, and switch it to a 50? All right? So I go back to my original data, and you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to order the data here. All right? And if you look at the data, if we order that data, what do we have? We have um, 68. 68, 70, 84, 93. 
And what I'm doing down here is I'm saying, all right, switch one of the 68s to a 50. I'm taking, say, this 68, getting rid of it, and making it a 50. What's that going to do to the mean, median, mode, range, sample variance, and standard deviation? Well, since the 68 went down, the mean is going to go down. The median is unaffected. It's still 70. The mode disappears because there's no longer two 68s. The range just got bigger, right? Because now I'm going, instead of going uh, 93 to 68, instead of having that range, it goes even further down to 50. So the range gets bigger. The data is more spread out, so all measures of variation are increased. So the range got bigger, and the standard deviation and the variance will both increase as well. I don't know by how much, but I'm certain that, th that they will increase. So that's sort of how I came up with all these answers down here. The mean would decrease, the median would not change, the mode would go away, and all measures of variation that we have, range, standard deviation, variance, would increase. All right. So that's getting, you know, this big list of descriptive statistics and what happens whenever you change some of the, some of the numbers around. Now we're going to go to z-scores. That's one form of a relative standing that we discussed in 2.3. And so basically I want you to give the z-score for each of these um, test scores and determine which one is relatively larger. So I have a Score of 92 on a test with a mean of 78 and a standard deviation of 12. And the way we calculate the z-score, in case you forgot, is z equals x minus mu over sigma. So here, the 92 is the x, the mean is the mu, and the 12 is the sigma. So when I pl plug those numbers in here, I get 1.17. So that 92 was 1.17 standard deviations above the mean. When you look at its test um, where the value you got was, say, 75, the mean was 60, and the standard deviation was 6. And the z-score right here is x minus mu over sigma, which is 2.5. All right, so the 75, while being an actual lower score than the 92, um, with respect to the mean and standard deviation, is actually a far better score. Um, so the 75 is um, the relative best score. And is either score unusual? Well, if you recall, an unusual score is, was one that had a z-score below negative 2 or above 2. Uh, so yes, this, this 2.5 is above 2, so the 75 is actually an unusual score. That person did extremely well. So, so well that we call it unusual. All right, moving on. Here we're going to do relative standings, um, percentiles, quartiles, things like that. So, give the five number summary for the box plot and the box plot for these 21 scores. So, 21 scores here. I want you to find the five number summary. So, the easiest, the min and the max, 48, 98 my favorite. You're like almost done and it took you no time at all. And then Q1 comes from right here. That is, we're going to set that equal to piece of 25. So the index is 25 over 100 times 21. All right, that's, that's how many scores there are. You get 5.25. And remember, if you have a decimal, or not a whole number, you round up and you use the next term. So you use the sixth term. So Q1 is 68. Q2 is the median. You can calculate that using P50. But you can also see, all right, there's 21 terms. That means I have a lower 10 here and an upper 10 there, and then one right in the middle. That's going to be my median of 76. And then Q3, I have to take... 75% of 21 to get my index. The index is 15.75 because it's not a whole number. I round up and use the 16th term. So I use the 16th term which produces an 86. So that's the five number summary. You get a box plot that looks like this. Look, this is about the min. 
the max. The median is right here at 76. And we have 68 and 86. Q1, Q3. So they seem to match up to the numbers. It should match up to the numbers that we get here. It sort of gives us a picture of what the data looks like. All right, calculate the GPA for a student with these grades. So this is just a weighted average. And the idea is you start off with your grades. You convert those to letter or numerical equivalents. You have to make sure you have the credits for each course. Those act as the weights. And so here's the formula right here. And basically it says you take the credits times the numerical grade and get W times X. So 3 times 4 is 12, 1 times 4 is 4, 3 times 4 is 12, 6 times 1 is 6, 4 times 2 is 8. You add all those up, 42, and that's the top part of the fraction. And when you add up all the weights here, 3 plus 1 plus 3 plus 6 plus 4, 17, that went right to there. The GPA is 2.47, right? It's just a weighted average, where the weights are the credits and um, the scores are the numerical values of the grades. Here I want you to find a weighted average to determine the average of all players in a certain hockey league, right? So you have three teams, the A team, the B team, the C team. There are 10 players on the A team, 13 on the B, and 7 on the C. And the average from each team, 78.5, 64.1, 3.3. So the question is, use a, um, or the request is to calculate the mean weight of all kids on the cross ice mites hockey team. All right? So the weights are going to be the number of kids on each team. The values are going to be the averages from within each team. So we're going to use this formula for a weighted average. We take W times X, and we get this value. That's for the A team. W times X, we get this value for the B team. W times X, and we get this value for the C team. So notice we're adding them all up. So we get 2,005.4. That goes on the top divided by the total number of um, players. And the total number of players here is 23 is 30, right? Okay, so when we take that, the sum, divided by 30, we get 66.8 pounds. So that's the average of all the players in the league. And the key thing to remember is that you don't want to take the average of the averages only because there's a different number of kids that contribute to that value. Right. So weighted averages. And that wraps up Chapter 2. So I will see you in Chapter 3. Thanks. Bye.